This is the fourth part of today's session on imaging and lesions and in this part we will look at reverse inference and also how the fMRI can be used to measure connectivity in the brain. What is reverse inference? It refers to inferring the engagement of a particular mental process from the activation of a particular brain region. As an example, the amygdala is known to be activated by anxiety and now if we measure the amygdala and see that it is activated when an individual views an image of a spider, we might infer that there is um, that this individual felt anxious when viewing a spider. So why do people rely on reverse inference? So we as psychologists, as psychologists researchers, want to know about cognitive processes rather than the neural process itself. For example, we might want to know about the motivation underlying a particular social behavior and this might be we might be able to measure that by looking at the neural process, but we're not interested in a neural process itself. And I want to give you two examples showing you why this can be problematic. So in this study, um, brains of swing voters were scanned to, um, by, with, using fMRI and what researchers here found was that when they showed subjects the words Democrat, Republican, or independent, the uh, participants exhibited high levels of activity in the part of the brain called the amygdala, which according to them indicated anxiety. The two areas in the brain associated with anxiety and disgust, the amygdala and the insular, were especially active when men viewed um, the word Republican. So does this really indicate that swing voters were disgusted when they saw the word Republican? Here's another example. Most striking of all was the flurry of activation in the insula, which is associated with feelings of love and compassion. The subjects' brains responded to the sound of their phones as they would respond to the presence or proximity of a girlfriend, boyfriend or family member. In short, they loved their iPhones. So you might already see a contradiction here because in one, in one study the insula was used or activity in the insula was used as a measure of disgust and here it was used as a measure of love. So how can this be? Well, the problem is that um, the insula is not very specific. So in the politics article insula was associated with disgust and in the iPhone article the insula was associated with love. And that is not necessarily um, wrong because the insula might or was shown to be involved in a variety of emotions. And this is not just for the insula, this is for many brain regions. They are often not functionally specific. So for example, the amygdala is known to respond to anxiety, but studies also reported that it responds to fear, to happiness and other emotions. The insula is even more functionally heterogeneous. It responds to fear, disgust, anxiety, happiness, love, bodily awareness of emotion and pain. So not very specific. So is it wrong to infer anything about involved brain regions and their functionality from fMRI data? Well, not necessarily. We just need to make sure that we um, know what we're talking about. So the brain region we're looking at, our target brain region, needs to be functionally specific to make such inferences. So for example, if a brain region only responds to one specific um, emotion, then it is functionally specific. Consistency is also important. So that means that the brain region is activated every time the emotion is induced. So this would be a high consistency because it's active every time. This is a low consistency because it's only active every other time. And then the spatial correspondence is important. So is it really the same region that we're looking at as for example compared to previous studies? Because sometimes it might just be a neighboring region or maybe a sub part of a specific brain region. For example the amygdala has subparts and some of them are more sensitive to negative emotions and others more to positive emotions. So it does really make a difference how 
uh, how high the spatial correspondence here is. So if we make sure that we have a high functional specificity, a high consistency, and a high spatial correspondence, then we can reduce the risk of um, making inferences that are actually not true. The insula is actually one of the most functionally heterogeneous regions in the brain, which um, shows that it is a low that it has a low functional specificity. So those two studies that I've talked about were probably uh, not um, great at providing very concluding date, conclusive data on their claims because they targeted a brain area that is um, having a very low functional specificity. Here is another example. Um, in this study, self-viewing was found to be associated with negative uh, effect rather than reward in a highly in highly narcissistic man. So, um, what the authors write here is viewing one's own face as compared to faces of friends and strangers was accompanied by greater activation in the dorsal and ventral anterior cingulate cortex or ACC in highly narcissistic men. And then they conclude, these results suggest that highly narcissistic men experience greater negative effect or emotional conflict during self-relevant processing. But just like the insula, ACC is highly functionally heterogeneous, as you can see here. ACC is involved in all these different processes. Let's talk about fMRI and connectivity. So traditionally, fMRI addresses functional specialization questions. So for example, the region um, A responds to some stimulus or some conditions. So we're very... Okay, let's talk about fMRI and connectivity in the brain. So traditionally, fMRI addresses functional specialization. So for example, we are comparing different stimuli, different conditions, some kind of experimental manipulation, and then see how a specific region responds to that um, experimental manipulation. Um, or we could um, compare different regions and see how one responds differently from another region. However, the functional integration also needs to be considered to better understand the brain and cognitive processes. So basically, how do brain regions communicate with each other? This is essential to understanding cognition because oftentimes um, which brain regions are involved are is very telling about the cognitive function and how they communicate might tell us a lot about what is really going on in the brain. So, um, connectivity describes how the activity in region A is related to the activity in region B. For example, um, this is an empirical finding. Um, if you compare healthy adults and patients with schizophrenia, then they might have the same brain regions active in a specific task. So you don't see any difference in which brain regions are active and how active they are, but the correlation between these two um, regions might be different. So in this study, they found that patients with schizophrenia show a lack of correlation between brain regions. So how can we do this? It's very easy, actually. We just look at the correlation across time in two brain regions. So, for example, um, when you have um, two brain regions, two and one, here and here, we can measure the correlation across time. And then we indicate the correlation here with, for example, a specific color. So this would be the correlation between uh, region 1 and 2 across time. And then this here, for example, might be the correlation between 
region 1 and region 3 or some other region. So you can do this for all regions. All regions in the brain are correlated with all other regions in the brain. And then you get some kind of functional connectivity map. So this here, for example, is the functional connectivity map for location 2. So the bright yellow here indicates the correlation with um, activity at, at, at location 2. And of course, it's very yellow around location 2 because this is an autocorrelation, um, meaning that here region 2 is correlated with region 2. But you can see that neighboring regions are also highly correlated. And of course, the closer a region is to another region, the more they are correlated in activity. So you could make a functional connectivity map for uh, all locations in the brain and then show how well they are connected with other regions in the brain. This would be, for example, the functional connectivity map for location 1. Here's another illustration of the same principle. So this would be uh, the normal functional connectivity between two regions. And then in this study, what they found was that in patients that had a stroke, the functional connectivity is not, um, is not there anymore. There's like, they are decorrelated. So sometimes one brain region is active when the other one is not and vice versa. So um, the connectivity is disturbed here and um, using fMRI such um, problems can be identified and for example be related to, um, well, to loss of functionality due to a stroke. Okay, so much about fMRI and reverse inference and connectivity. In the last part of today's session we will talk about brain lesion studies.